All right. We're going to turn to John chapter 11. We have been renovating our house. We're repainting things, and I realized today I don't have a computer. So um, the, I wasn't able to print off the questions, but that's okay because I'm just going to go off script anyway. So um, the first thing I want to do is do, do some review of John. Um, and then because I'm going to tell you, there's a lot in chapter 11, and it is not a short chapter either. And, um, and again, I, I do believe that John chapter 11 is just a continuation of thought of some of the other things that we've already had in John chapter 9. But the first thing I wanted to kind of go over was these miracles that are being performed because this one becomes uh, probably one of his most prominent ones. Uh, here in John chapter 11, but I want to kind of see the progression of these miracles. So what was the very first miracle that um, that we saw and in what chapter was it in? Yeah, he had to turn the water into wine. And that was in where? Yeah, King of the Galilee. Um, Rick, what were you going to say? Chapter 2. Chapter 2 is where we find that uh, miracle. It was in, uh, in uh, Cana. Um, and we also see that, you know, they continue to say, and we, we continue to kind of see this as people's uh, faith kind of progresses, that he's some kind of prophet, that he's just like, who, who's he normally referred to as? Like unto who? To yeah, Elijah, Moses. You know those those um, those prophets, um, and then we also, if you, you know, I don't know if this is necessarily, you know, him trying to, you know, say that he was like Moses, that he was like Elijah, but some of these things that he did, uh, actually Moses and Elijah had done, and um, one of the things that I, that I found was Moses had um, brought water from a rock, in other words, turned something into something else. Um, and you know that it came from a rock um, and um, he also changed bad water to good water uh, and here we see Jesus kind of changing water into wine we also know that one of the plagues that uh, Moses was involved in was um, those vessels that they had of water and it turned to what to blood and so you know this changing uh, of water and um, we also see in the second um, the second one was what in John chapter 4. The nobleman's son being healed. Um, and we also see that um, in that, you know, kind of some of the discussion that comes out of it, but we also see if you look back in, in Elijah's uh, story, had Elijah ever healed anyone like that? Healed a son. From the uh, lady's uh, son that, that he healed, um, and then we also see in the third one that he has, and that is in um, uh, John chapter five. John chapter five, and this will be the third miracle. Yep. The, the healing of the invalid, right? The healing of the invalid, and um, by the pool of Bathsheba, I'm sorry, Beth, 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 uh, Elijah actually healed the captain who had uh, leprosy. If you guys remember that, so you know, so there's a, a healing of, of that as well. Um, and then we see in his fourth one was in John chapter six. Yeah, the feeding of the 5,000. Um, and we see that Moses, um, you know, whenever he commanded them, you know, to bring manna, and there was a lot of discussion about, you know, give us this bread, you know, and stuff like that. So, again, you know, he's still in line with, and you can kind of see why they would be thinking that this guy's a prophet, um, at least because of the, the things that he's been doing. And then uh, the fifth one that he does is also in John chapter 6, as I uh, mentioned, 16 through 21. 
Yeah, where he walks on water. Um, and we see that, um, you know, I don't know if this is a reference to that or not, but I said, well, Moses divided the water, you know, so I don't know if that's anything with that or not. But um, we do see this, I, you know, and I thought this is interesting, was that if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, it says the Spirit of the uh, Lord did what? Moved across the water. And now you have Him actually walking on water. So um, the sixth one that we had was the one we, we just spoke about. And that was a couple, we've been talking about a couple weeks now. John chapter 9. The healing of the blind man. This is the only miracle that you know you can't really relate to anything in the in the past. As a matter of fact, it stated that. When have you ever heard of any of the prophets ever doing this? We see that it was a very specific um, miracle that he does. It's not the only time that he does it, but he does it very specifically. And John talks a lot about this as to why that miracle happened. First of all, it was to bring glory to God's name because he was doing those works in which um, he was uh, asked to do from the Father. But it is to bring light into the world, into a world of darkness. And we see that kind of played out in that whole scenario and that whole discussion. That discussion that they have in John chapter 9 actually spills on over into John 10 and in John 11 as well as we'll see shortly. Um, all right, so this will be the last um, miracle that we read in, in the book of John. John. John's book now kind of starts taking a turn, and it starts talking more about some of the teachings that, that Christ does um, from here on out and the preparation that he has for his death that, that is upcoming. Um, but we also see, you know, and, and I say these are the only miracles, but there's other prophecies as well that, you know, Jesus said... <clears throat> tear down this temple, I'll raise it up again, you know, and we also see some of the prophecies of his uh, impending death that he has, that he's going to be raised again. John talks about those things. Um, and then we also see uh, him being raised again um, on the third day. Uh, some people would throw that into miracle. You know, I, I think it was just his purpose and his reason it was here. But we do see that at least with these seven miracles, they continue to kind of ramp up and kind of get, you know, bigger and bolder. And we also see something else is the bigger and bolder they, they, um, that they are, what starts to happen to the crowds. I'm sorry, what? Start to grow. They're starting to grow. A lot of talk is starting to happen about this man, uh, Jesus. Um, a lot of people are starting to believe that he is the Christ. And just as many as you have that says he's, that he they believe that he's the Christ, you have even more that say absolutely not. Um, and we see mainly the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the time starting to disagree with um, with him on uh, subjects. But it becomes much more than just disagreement. As a matter of fact, they start to try to plot out his death. Many times he he evades them and escapes. How that happens. I don't know. I just know that it says that he slips off. And um, so, but we do see that um, there's a lot going on. And John chapter 11 is kind of the kind of the highest arc as far as those miracles go when we, when we start to talk about it. But I want to back up just a little bit into John chapter 9 where Jesus heals that blind man. And they, um, and he says, I'm healing the blind man so the work of God may be shown. Because remember what the question was, and we talked about how their question was, who sinned, whether it was this man or his parents that sinned for him to be blind. He says, neither one. And then at the very end of John chapter 9, we see him talking to the Pharisees, and they ask, are we blind? And he said, because your sin remains, yes. And so we see that whole question that they ask in the very beginning is a very physical question but it ends up with a very spiritual thought at the very end of it but we see that some of the things that they were uh, disagreeing on was some of his teaching and that is at the very beginning of john chapter 9 um, and his disciples uh, asked well let's move on down um, in verse 4 we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day night is coming when no one can work so there's going to come a point in time 
that, that this is going to end. He repeats this in John chapter 11. It's, it's, so it's nothing new that we, that we learn here. But um, we do see also the whole, um, the whole miracle that happens here. But we see that in verse 13, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had formed him blind. We saw that whole trial and that monkey gathering that they had with that. And how he said, you know, look, you continue to ask me these questions. Is it because you too want to be his disciple? So we see, we talked about the blind man's faith kind of growing, growing, growing. You know, it was just a guy. I don't know who he was. And then, you know, I think he may be a prophet. I think, you know, I'm a disciple now. He eventually tells Jesus, I believe. I believe that you are the Son of God. And so um, what happened to him and that whole story really starts to kind of play into some of the things that starts to happen in John chapter 11 because John chapter 9 is really where we see the Pharisees really start being infuriated and frustrated by some of the attempts, first of all, because of the crowds and everything else, to really kind of get Jesus um, in, into custody. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, yeah, we're going to go ahead and change from the miracles and everything. But these, these verses and these chapters are just highlights. Yes. According to the last verse in this book. Yes, and you know, exactly. I mean, they're not all the miracles that he did, but John chose these specifically so that you may believe. And you can see as these miracles continue to grow in, in popularity, or not popularity, but more, they become more public, I guess is what I'm trying to say. They're becoming more public, they're being talked about more, and it just seems like the more that the Pharisees are trying to push back and we see that in John chapter 9 because they're trying to get somebody to be dishonest. They've already threatened people that if you say anything about it, we'll throw you out of the temple. And now we have this um, here in John chapter 9 where they're trying to get someone to say that he really wasn't born blind. So now we're trying to even twist truth and everything else that, you know, that are, are real in people's lives. Go ahead, Paul. That's so. Yeah, I see and ears to hear. It's really bring that out, you know, because the Pharisees didn't have the heart to even see or even hear God's message. Well, we continue to see something about the Jews, and that is they are looking for a very specific thing in their head that the way this Messiah ought to be. Yeah, and it just, it, he did not fit their mold of what he, what they thought that he ought to be. First of all, because he's speaking against them. And that just doesn't seem right that, you know, someone that's from God would be speaking against the priests and the Pharisees and, you know, but yet Christ is because they have failed in their mission to, um, to educate God's people and in their mission to bring God closer or uh, bring people closer to God. All right, anything else? All right, because we're going to move on um, into uh, John chapter 10 very quickly. I am the good shepherd. We heard all that he had to say about that. Um, and then we see also that he says, you know, you're not going to be able to hear because you're not my sheep. Uh, my sheep will actually hear my voice. Um, he goes on in verse 22 to say, at that time the Feast of Dedication took, uh, took place in Jerusalem. It was winter. Jesus walked in the temple, and he starts giving this... Um, this sermon that him and the Father are one. Um, and they ask, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. And he tells them very plainly, you know, look at the works that I've done. If you don't believe the words that I'm saying, look at the works that are being done. They're right there in front of you. And um, they go on to talk about, in verse 27, and I want you to note this, because this is where it kind of starts to tie into John chapter 11. In verse 27, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Verse 28, <clears throat> I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So he makes a very bold statement. 
But what does he say about his sheep and about his followers? They will hear. They'll hear, but what will they get? What's the reason that we would do? What? Everlasting, life. Everlasting life. You'll never see death. And then they start to pick up stones in verse 31 because um, I've shown you many good works. Well, which one are you going to stone me for? You know, you ask the question, I answer the question. You don't like the answer, now you're going to stone me. So you pick out which over one of these good works that I've done and tell me why you're going to stone me for those things. And of course they say it's not because of that, it's because you make yourself out to be God. And so um, we see uh, more discussion uh, on that and then we see in verse um, 40, he went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first and he remained there. And then um, people come out and they're talking about John. He never did any signs, but he told us who this guy was going to be. And a lot of people started believing in Jesus. So let's move on in to John chapter 11 because I want you to kind of keep in mind in John chapter uh, 10 and in other uh, previous to this, even some of the chapters previous to this, Jesus talks about he is the life and that he gives life. And remember, there was even a discussion that they had about, well, who are you to say that you're never going to die and that your followers will never die? You have Moses, you have Abraham, you have all of these people who have died and gone on and you're saying you're greater than them. So we kind of keep that in mind because that's where a lot of this is going to start to mesh together. So in John chapter 11, all right, verse 1, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Now I looked up, anywhere that Lazarus kind of shows up, this is the only place that we actually learn about Lazarus. Now there's the story in Luke chapter 14 uh, about Lazarus and the rich man, completely different people here. All right, so, but we see this is um, in um, the only place that we see the raising of Lazarus is in John's account. It was Mary, <clears throat> it was the Mary who appointed, anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So he's kind of giving us a little short foreshadowing because we wouldn't know that till a little bit later. So the sisters sent word to him saying, Lord, behold, he who you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, The sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified. Now, that statement, they come up to him and they say, You know, the guy that you love, Lazarus, he's very sick. And what's his statement? It's not, it's not going to kill him. It's not unto death. But he's sick for a reason. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> so what were we talking about before with the, with the blind man? Blind for a reason. He's blind for a reason. And he gives the exact same reason. Give glory. To give glory to God. So, and I, this statement that he makes that it's not unto death, or um, he's not, uh, it's not the end in death, but for the glory of God, so the Son of Man may be glorified by it. He makes this statement, of course we know that Lazarus does die, but he makes this statement and you can understand some of the questions and some of the concerns that they had. Lord, had you been here, he would not have died. So, you know, that's why some of this, they're thinking that, well, he's not going to die. All right. But when Jesus heard this, this sickness is not end in death. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. So the question would come in, why did he decide to stay? To glorify the Father. To glorify the Father? Okay. Lazarus needed to die. But <laughs> right. Yeah, in his, his previous statement about not unto death, he's simply saying that's not the end result. Here. Correct. That's that when, when the story's done here, that's not where we're going to be. But he had to give that time for Lazarus to die. Right, and they didn't understand that. What they're thinking is Lazarus is really sick and he's going to recover from it. And um, but you know, again, what he's saying is it is not the end result 
that someone that I love, and it says it a couple of times, I believe there's a reason that he says it a couple of times, is going to die. So, um, but what we see here is that he decides to stay, he decides to stay for a very specific reason, I do believe so that Lazarus does die. And so there's no question about what's about to happen. So you can kind of see the drama kind of starting to fill the air a little bit. Because when we hit the arc of this, I mean, it, it is really amazing how much is involved here with John's writing because he's writing from a very unique perspective in the fact that John says, I was there, I saw these things. And so all of this is being recorded by John because he was there. All right. So, after um, in verse 6, so when he heard that he was sick, he decided to stay. And then we get down to verse 7. Then after this, he says to the disciples, uh, let's go to Judea again. And the disciples says, what's wrong with you? Because those guys are trying to kill you over there, and you're wanting to go back there? What? This isn't making much sense. Now, again, I don't know at this point if Lazarus has already died. Obviously, he hasn't because they're just thinking that he's just sick. So why would you go to a place just to visit someone who's sick and you know he's not going to die? That's, if, if I were a disciple, that's what I would be thinking. But they say this, Rabbi, the Jews who were just seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? And Jesus answers, remember what I told you about the light in the day? Are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Now remember what we talked about in John chapter 9 where he was talking about there's only so many, much time that we have left here. And then all of this has to you know, stop. And so re-emphasizing that, um, he, he makes that statement. Now, you know, I don't know if some of the disciples kind of picked up on that, you know, um, or not. That you know, he's talking about time kind of winding down here for him. But there's only a certain amount of time that we have to kind of do these things so that people may believe that I am um, the Christ, because they're not going to continue on forever and always. All right. In verse 11, then he said, and after that he said to them, "Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep." But I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. Now, of course, they're thinking what? Think he's asleep. Now you think he's asleep. Um, this isn't the first time that we that we uh, read of this um, this type of language in Luke chapter thirteen and verse thirty three. Jesus says, "Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow for the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away." From Jerusalem, and I think I got the wrong one there. Uh, yeah, Matthew chapter 27 and verse 52, and this is after the resurrection of Jesus. It says the tombs were, all, were also were open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. So this figure of speech that he's using, you know, can be used for a person is dead. So you can understand their confusion because in context of what their thinking was is that he's just asleep because he's just really sick. And so um, when Jesus says this, it you know can kind of it kind of shakes them a little bit and you can kind of see that here in just a second. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. You know, he'll, he'll wake up. Uh, now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant he was taking rest and sleep. Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So now we kind of see what Jesus' plan was all along by this waiting. So I want to note, note something, and that is, first of all, whenever he... Uh, does, how does he find out that Lazarus is sick? He knows all facts. Well, no, it says that somebody came and told him. But he makes this statement, Lazarus is dead, how does he find out? He 
it just knows it just knows and and so you know whenever I whenever I um, see that you know it, something's kind of going on here that Jesus understood what was about to happen go ahead it says the sisters said to him told him that you know Lazarus was sick the one he loves is sick um, and he waits this time by the time he gets there we know he's been in the grave for four days just think of the perspective of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus what they went through there, there are times when we want God to fix something make it better, make it better now but there's a bigger purpose in letting us go through the full trial right and is to the glory of God. Do, do we have that kind of faith? Um, so they, no doubt, over these few days, they're, they're going through tremendous emotional and, of course, Lazarus' physical problems. For a lot of anguish. But that didn't mean God didn't love him. Right. He still loved him through the whole thing. Right. And, you know, one of the things that I think that we need to, to point out is the fact that, as you pointed out, that they are just kind of going through this without Jesus. And whenever they get there, whenever Jesus comes there, we kind of see this clamoring to him. They, they know who they want to comfort them. And, um, you know, there's there's a lot of questions about why didn't you come and, and if you've been here and stuff like that. And we'll see that here very shortly. But you can see the anguish that they have been going through. And, you know, if Jesus kind of loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus, how close do you think all those guys were you know so and um, you know so this is you know a, a very traumatic time in, in these people's lives um, but he, he tells them plainly Lazarus has died and I, for your sake I'm glad that I was not there so he's telling the disciples you know this is going to be the one thing that I'm glad that you're not there and that you get to see this what's about to happen and um, but let us go to him now, notice who John picks to talk about in this with Thomas. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples what? Let's go die with him. Let's go die. Today's a good day to die. You know, I mean, and you know, so we often say that, what do we normally call him? Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas. Does this sound like a guy who has any kind of doubt? Yes, he's going to live. <laughs> yeah, he doubts he's going to live much longer. Yeah, they're going to kill him when he goes back. Yeah, I mean, and that's the discussion. Why would you go back there? You know they're going to stone you. And he said, look, Lazarus is dead. We're going to go visit Lazarus. And so, you know, but we see kind of some of the courage that these guys actually do have. Now, John does not give us a lot in terms of the disciples and kind of what they're feeling, what they're thinking, you know, any of their real actions or anything like that until a little bit later on. But this book is not focused upon them. But it's just very interesting to me that he mentions what Thomas says here. And, you know, maybe that invokes something inside of John that he, he remembered this. Um, but, you know, later on we see that he brings up Thomas and Thomas is my Lord and my God, you know, because he gets to see the the uh, imprints of the where the nails were, you know, the holes and everything. And so, you know, but he, he mentions Thomas here. I just thought it was interesting. But he says, let us go, so we'll die with him. And well, then, I, go ahead. I, I appreciate you writing that out. I read that before. I never did see that. But... John brought it out, not me. <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's it's in there, and you know, a lot of times we just kind of read through that, and we don't really take note. And um, you know, and I believe, you know, again, it could be a nod from John to, you know, to uh, Thomas that you know Thomas had a lot of courage. It was not he was not a fearful person, and we see this courage kind of rise and wane as it as it comes and goes between the. The uh, disciples, and um, you know, I mean, if we we could turn back to where um, to where uh, Peter says, and, and I mean, we're only just a couple more chapters in John chapter thirteen. Uh, Peter says, "Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you." So we see that these guys are pretty fired up, 
And I am sure it's because of what they've seen and who they recognize that Jesus actually is. Any more questions, comments? Just that this is the second time in John that we've seen a miracle happen for the purpose of other people. We have Lazarus here, he's died. He says, I'm glad we weren't there. And we went back to the guy that was born blind. And Cyprus was like, okay, who sinned? And he's like, not the reason. This was for so God could show. Well, you know, all of these, specifically the more public ones, are being done so that the teaching that he does, people will listen to and respond to. Um, you know, all of the miracles are done for a very specific reason, as you, as you pointed out. You know, this one, it seems to be very specific to the disciples. I'm glad that you aren't here. But we see that once it happens, the, the floodgate of frustration that the Pharisees have with him just goes over because they cannot hide this. And they've tried to make someone to where he really wasn't born blind, but well, you can't get around this. And we're going to see their frustration with that also. And so, but the more and more um, that Jesus does of teaching and things like that, that's where people have a problem with it. It's not necessarily the miracles, but the, the teaching. But he's doing the miracles, so they'll believe the teaching. Let's move on. Now, when Jesus, and I'm in verse 17, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days, as Stephen pointed out. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Mary, Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So, is this normal that people come when you... Yes, it is. It's very normal. You know, you want to gather around those who have lost... Um, this isn't the first time in the scriptures we see this. You know, Job, whenever he had his loss, we have the friends kind of come in there. Um, but this happens in our everyday life also. And, you know, these guys, even after four days, they're still mourning with her, uh, with, with the sisters. And so, um, you know, they, these are, are people who, you know, love this family very much. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated at the house. Now, I don't know why that's stated that way. I don't think it's necessarily anything bad about Mary. It's just that she was there. Martha came out because we see whenever, in a little bit, that she actually gets a little excited that Jesus is there. Um, but what we see is Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now remember what Jesus had told them. He's sick, but he's not what? Not unto death. Not unto death. Now her thinking is that you know it's he's just going to be really sick, but he's going to recover. He actually dies, and so now she's saying, "Had you been here, you don't know what's going on." Yeah, you know we he would not have died then. You could have healed him. I think her sitting there, no necessary for us to understand. That she was just no, I think no. Well, she's she's very upset. Uh, yeah. She's upset, obviously, because her brother's died, and she, um, you know, I don't think it's nothing, anything accusatory. No. And here's why I think that, because of the next statement that she makes after Jesus answers her. Because he answers her and he says, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. So she understands that there's some, that this isn't just the end of all things. And um, also that there is a resurrection to come later on. But what she's saying is, had you been here, we wouldn't have to go through this anguish because you could have killed him. So Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Now, imagine what she just went through. 
And he has just made a statement that I'm the resurrection, I'm the life, and everybody who believes in me will never die. Do you believe that or not? And her statement is, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. See who, who is coming into the world, who is coming into the world. And so we see that she has a measure of faith that this is the Son of God, that He is the Christ, that He is who He says He is, and that His teachings are in line with what God has, has stated about the Christ and the Messiah. Now, his, go ahead. I just want to make clear this interaction between Jesus and Martha and Jesus and Mary is not confrontational. There's no, no it's not. There's no anger, resentment toward Him whatsoever. This, the, this is between two people who love each other. Martha, who eminently respects Jesus and, and His power to heal, and then she mentions even there in verse 22, I know that even now, whatever right. you ask of God, He'll do. She just couldn't conceive of what was about to happen. Correct. And especially, you know, we, we, try to, we try to see, when we have the Scriptures we can kind of look back on, you know, it's a little easier for us. But in that moment that that stuff is happening and being stated, it's not into death. Well, we're thinking that, you know, he's not going to die. Well, he does die. So had Jesus been there, he would have been healed. Jesus wasn't there, however. And that, again, to, you, to your point, it's nothing that she's angry about. It's just a statement of who she really believes he is. He could have healed her if, if he saw fit. And so um, that that is... What, the, what transpires here. And again, I want to kind of point back to the fact that Jesus even says, I'm glad that you were here with me to the disciples and that we were not there so that you, because what you're about to witness is going to really put your faith over any, any edge that you may have. So she believes in the resurrection and he says, I am the resurrection. Now, I want to kind of point out this and what he says in this about him being the resurrection and eternal life and those who believe him, what? Will never die. Do you believe that? Now, that's a powerful question that he asked her. And that's a question that I think that a lot of us need you know, to ask ourselves. Do we really believe that if we understand who he is, and that we are a disciple of His, and that we're of His sheep, as He has said, and we hear His voice, and we follow Him, that we will never die. Now, it's obvious that what He's talking about here, she's not comprehending because Lazarus obviously is physically dead. Go ahead. And following what He says in 25 and 26, he who believes in me, though he may die, shall live again. Whoever lives and believes shall never die. So he's pointing forward to that resurrection. That whoever's died when when that resurrection, he's talking about the ultimate resurrection. Right. When that happens, then they're never going to die. Again. They're going to live Correct. eternally. Right. Um, not to take away from other statements he's made. You know, they believe in me, they'll never die. He's skipping over in between pointing to the ultimate result. Right. And you, we always have to remember also, John is writing this for a very specific purpose. And what we see in Jesus' teachings is He's trying to get us as humans to, um, you know, in His creation, to understand that what we see in creation is not the end of all things. And we have to be able to make that leap from what we see and what we, you know, the very carnal things into something that's more spiritual. And so that's the leap that's happening here, is that, yeah, you may die physically, but it don't mean you're dead. And, you know, we can have other discussion about that. Of course, we've got a lot of lot still to go, and uh, we're not going to make it through this chapter. But what we see here is that um, Jesus, again, is trying to pull people out of thinking very, you know, that physical, uh, things in the physical and kind of pull them over to the spiritual. This is not the first time it's happened and it won't be the last time in his teaching that it happens either. 
In verse 28, when she, said, when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and he is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. And that's the statement I was talking about. I don't know why it says that she was there. I don't think that was by choice. I think it was just a statement she was just there. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, as you think about it, you have this big crowd of Jews yeah. at their house. Um, word comes, Jesus is here. Martha hears that. She takes yes, off. Right. To, you know, just like we do. And then we catch up with each other later. It, it's just showing us the natural unfolding of right. what's happening. Yeah. And I don't think that Mary decided, I'm just going to sit here. I don't care no. if he's there or not. Because <laughs> her reaction here tells me something completely different. Especially when you jump in later and Mary's the one sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to him, Mark, uh, yeah. taking care of the dishes. Exactly, stuff. yeah. So here we have that she now hears that Jesus is there. So she rose up, rises up quickly. She goes to him. Um, and when she heard it, she rises. And then in verse 30, now Jesus had not yet come into the village but was still in the place where Martha had met him. Now, notice this. When Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out when they saw her excitement or whatever it was that she was showing, some kind of emotion, it was different than what she currently was. And so what did they decide to do? We better go with her. And they're thinking that she's going over to the gravesite to... More, and so they're going to go with her, and uh, and it says exactly that. Supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, "Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died." That sounds exactly like the same statement. Do you think they've had that conversation? Yes, I believe they probably had that conversation. Some, you know, if Jesus were here, he probably wouldn't have died. And yeah, you know, between the sisters, you know, and they're consoling one another. And so now the master has come, the teacher has come, and they make this statement to him, if you've been here, he would not have died. And again, nothing confrontational. It's just a statement of who they know that he is. And that is, he is the Christ. She makes that statement. I know that you're the Christ. I know that you're uh, all things, you know, about the Messiah and everything that you see in the Old Testament. And... I'm telling you, I understand and I know that had he been here, that had you been here, he would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. So, he gets a first-hand account of human suffering and that's why it's so important that we understand that he is fully God and fully human also. He had the full human experience, even loss of life and loss of loved ones. And that's why he can step in and be our advocate. Because in all things, he was tempted just like we were. He had a, a, a heart just like we do. He shows compassion just like we ought to. He has empathy. And all of these things we now understand because of his reaction here that God understands what it means to be separated from someone that you love. And he has empathy towards that. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. And then it says Jesus wept. So his emotion is now starting to overflow also in this whole scenario because again what have we been told about this family in Jesus they were close and they loved them it says Jesus wept so Jews said see how he loved him in verse 36 so they you know that was an outward appearance of the love that he, that he had. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Now, that's a question that you know some of them are asking. And again, I think it's more along the lines of they know that he could have had he been there, Lazarus would still be alive. I believe that's the whole discussion that's happening here. 
Um, I, I, I don't really know what their motive is behind asking that question, but I do know that you know they are at least acknowledging the power that Jesus has. First of all, the power that he had over the, to um, heal the blind man, and then also the power that he would have to keep someone alive who he was around. This this group that's come out to them to mourn and weep with them, they at least the majority I would say has a relationship with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. This is not a hostile group toward Jesus. Right. They they have a respect and a love for this family, and that's why they're out here. And they had either seen or they had heard about what happened with the blind man. And so they're in a similar position to Mary and Martha. Right. We've heard all of this. We've seen these things. We know about Him. We know about His power. And so, you know, if He was here, we we believe He could have done. Couldn't He have done? Surely He could have done. Right. Um, so this this is a um, friendly crowd, I would say. Yeah. I, you know, I, I I agree with you. I do know that there are some that say they continue to question Him rather than you know understanding that the power that He does have. Um, I, I truly believe just because of the statements that they have made with Mar uh, Mary and Martha, both of them made the statement, now this crowd makes the statement, if I believe about Mary and Martha and their statement that, yes, they are simply making a statement of who He is and what He could have done, I believe the same thing about the crowd. The, the English, I think, is where the question comes in because it says, but some of them said, you know, if you take that word but out, you can just say, some of them said, you know, this statement. But that word but in there for some reason, well, it kind of... And it depends on your translation. Like, right, I know it's not... The Duke e. James, the one that Paul uses, and some of them. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah I, and I'm reading now the ESV. Sure. The NASB actually says, um, so, uh, again, uh, the NASB says, but some of them said also. Well, then... Just a quick side point, you know, when Jesus says woman, sometimes right. we look at that and think, boy, that's really harsh, but actually it was a turn of the deer. deer correct. And, and we do lose some of that in the English translation right. in our culture. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Take so here we go with the emotion that's overflowing. This crowd is there. Everybody's in a very hyped up uh, emotional state right now. Verse 38, then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha says to him, the sister of the dead man said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor. He has been dead for four days. Her statement there tells us exactly the state that Lazarus is in. He's been dead for four days. And then what does Jesus say to her? Well, remember her statement. Do I? If you believe. Didn't I tell you that if you believe... It seems like they're so stuck in generations of physical law and rules that they can't seem to make that last jump over the hurdle to the spiritual teaching that Jesus is giving them. He might be dead in the flesh, but he's not dead. Yeah. They're not dead. They don't, they're not dead. And yet here we are 2,000 years later still learning yeah. the same the exact same lesson. Right. You know, and I mean, you know, we live in a physical universe also, and we try to figure out the physical laws, you know, how things happen. And, and can you imagine us trying to figure this out, that Jesus is about to say, uh, your brother's about to be alive again after he's been dead for four days? So, you know, to your, to your point, we have a hard time with that. And it's not just Mary and Martha that's having a hard time, we do also. And, you know, and, I, and that's why I continue to say, why, you know, what are we learning out of this? And what we can learn out of this 
is exactly what Mary and Martha did. We make a statement and then Jesus comes along a little bit and I just tell you, if you believe what you will see. And then he goes on to say, um, so they, uh, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. They took that to mean to take away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew and I know that you always hear me. But I am saying this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. So he says this statement so that, for what reason? The crowd. For the crowd to be able to hear. And he's given glory to who? God. To God. So that you, so that all of these people around will know that what's about to happen, you have done through me because you have sent me. Now all of this is kind of uh, working out here. And then we see in verse 43, when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen straps and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. And at this point of the story, you can see the emotion. You can probably hear some of the wonder of it, some of the amazement that's going on. And it's a good place to kind of fade to black because a new scene's about to open up. And we'll talk about that scene next week. But imagine what's just happened. And now what we were just talking about, Gail, we can make that leap now because it actually has happened. And we understand what Jesus is talking about whenever he says that I am the resurrection and the life. It's hard to imagine how they, how they, any of them ever were able to make that leap, even though they were seeing with their own eyes a lot of, not all of them, but a lot of them. Yeah. And hearing from people that they trusted so well. Yeah. I, don't, I don't wonder where I would be. Yeah. Right, the same down in Thomas Corner. Uh, right, well, and I was going to say, you know, Thomas came there to die. And he watches someone be raised. What do you think his thinking is now? So this was done for a very, you know, uh, a lot of people from a lot of people, but it was done for a very specific purpose. Again, it was not into death. I mean, the sickness was not into death. That's not going to be the end result, is what he said. And we can see that looking back now. It's not going to be the end result. It's not going to be death. And then we also see, you know, just kind of moving a little forward. You know, they're thinking on. Um, whenever he was asleep and he has to tell him he's dead and we're going to go see him. and then their anxiety over that so we see that this is a story that's got a lot in it and it's not we're not even done with it yet because now like I said whenever we start to fade back into light if it were a movie it'd be fading out you know with all this clamoring and you know and all this uh, excitement and everything and then we kind of open back up to many of the Jews therefore who had come with Mary and seen what he did believed in him and then the Pharisees come back into play so we'll stop there and we'll pick up there any questions or comments before we dismiss <laughs>